my fellow Singaporeans, let me say this. I am the leader of the People's Voice, which is the only political party in Singapore that has called for the abolition of SECA, which was the comprehensive economic treaty signed between Singapore and India in 2005. Now, other political parties have jabbed away, asked questions. The PSP, the Progress Singapore Party, have taken a different angle. They have not called for the outright abolition of SECA. Rather, they want what they term a rebalancing of the job situation in Singapore. And my good friend Leong Man Wai, the NCMP from the PSP, has spoken about SECA quite a bit in Parliament since he assumed his role. And uh, I'm a great admirer of Man Wai. Um, I have known him for quite a long time. And many of our ideas are common. And uh, our ideology, we are not that far apart. And I suppose the PAP got irritated when Man Wai kept pressing the SECA issue in Parliament. And so, of course, a couple of months ago, Shan Mugam, in quite hostile tones, and, you know, I would never use that type of language in Parliament against another parliamentarian, said, and I'm looking at you, Mr. Leong, and I hope you file a motion to debate SECA. And so Man Wai, in due course, and the PSP accepted the challenge. And that led to the ministerial statements that were issued by Ong Yi Kang and uh, Tan Si Leng in Parliament this week. What are my impressions of the statement? You know, I made a video when Ong Yi Kang had not even finished speaking in Parliament. And I posted that video almost immediately. And I called Ong Yi Kang's statement the biggest fudge I've ever come across as far as a ministerial statement is concerned. Now, before the parliamentary session, the PSP had filed quite a number of questions seeking figures, data from the government. If I was the PSP, I would not have taken that route, but everyone to his own. And I never thought that the, PS, the PAP would come up with the figures that the PSP had sought. And true enough, they did not. You can see for yourself, if you go to Hazel Poir's uh, Facebook, I think, she has listed her complaints there about what the PAP did not answer. But I knew that would happen. Because when have you ever had a straight answer from the PAP? All right, when have you ever had... Can, can you imagine when they can term a local, a local, right? L-O-C-A-L, -L, to include both a Singaporean and a PR? My friends, a PR is not a local. A PR is a foreigner with the right to long-term stay in Singapore. I do not know whether it's appropriate for me to say this, but don't try and compare a donkey with a horse, all right? They are different animals, yeah? And what I took particular objection to Ong Yi Kang's statement was this. He started off with a broad generalization. FTAs are good with, for Singapore. And so he would classify SACA as an FTA. And then he will go on to challenge Leung Man Wai. Oh, so do you agree that FTA is crucial to Singapore's survival. If I was Man Wai, and Man Wai, I think, agreed that FTA was crucial to Singapore's success, I would not have given that 
broad acceptance. I do accept that some FTAs are good for Singapore. But whether it is good for Singapore depends on whether it is beneficial to Singaporeans. That is my criteria of whether an FTA is good for Singapore or not. I am not one of those. If you throw me the terminology and FTA, I will tell you, oh, that is good. That is crucial for Singapore's success. And you know something? I am not even sure that I would classify SECA as an FTA. All right? I will go on to expand in a little while why I say that. But for me to suggest that every FTA is good for Singapore without a minute examination of the details is bunkum, is nonsense. We have done very well in the past with FTAs. I would agree. That is why under Le the Lee Kuan Yew era, we progressed quickly. But why was that? It was because Singaporeans benefited generally, largely, because of those FTAs. It is very different when it comes to SECA, as, shall, as I shall expound in a little while. So to me, SECA is a bad deal for Singaporeans. So, Let's continue with Ong Kong's story. His justification for SECA is, you must agree that FTA is crucial for Singapore's survival and success. And if you accept that, then you must necessarily accept that SECA is good. In summary, that was Ong Kong's argument. All right? That was what I heard. As far as providing data and numbers, he hardly provided any. As I said in the video that I made almost instantly uh, during his speech, there were two eye-catching numbers he gave. He said that in 2005, when SECA was signed, Singapore's direct investment in India was $1.3 billion. It has now increased to $61 billion, I believe, in 2020. And he glorified that. But let's take a step back, my friends. Those Singaporean investments into India, who have they benefited? No doubt, a lot more Indians in India have been employed. No doubt, the Indian subsidiaries of the Singapore investors may have benefited. But have the economic benefits flowed back to Singapore? Have the economic benefits flowed back to Singaporeans? You know Ong Yi Kang and the Manpower Minister, Mr. Tan, they belong to this bunch of globalists. They love the idea of free trade. They love the idea of freedom of goods, freedom of services. All right? And that is why the PAP's mantra over the last few decades has always been, we must be freely open. My position is this, and my party's position is this. We can be freely open provided it benefits Singaporeans. I am not enamored with this label of a free economy if it does not at the end of the day benefit Singaporeans. And to them, if the big companies, the rich businessmen, do very well by investing overseas. Their assumption is that these riches will trickle down to the ordinary Singaporean. That has hardly been the case. 
that has hardly been the evidence. My friends, the PAP calls us a first world nation. Do you know that today in Singapore? Four in ten workers earn less than $3,000 a month. That is inclusive of CPF. All right. Once you take away the CPF contributions whatsoever, you are down below $2,500, maybe $2,300, $2,400. We are hardly first world as far as wages are concerned. Yeah. And the PAP have never given us tangible data to show how SECA has benefited Singaporeans. You know, I am not so concerned about figures, my friends. Friends, I am not as concerned as the PSP are about figures. A very famous American judge by the name of Oliver Wendell Holmes, a Supreme Court judge, once famously said, the life of the law is not logic, it is experience. And my friends, I am sure you don't need figures to convince you that SACA is a bad deal for Singaporeans. You can see it, you can experience it yourself. When you go to places like Changi Business Park, whom some have infamously renamed as Chennai Business Park, or you go to the Marina Bay Financial Center and you see the multitudes of Indian nationals working there. All right? Now, how can it be, and I ask myself, how can it be, even if you say that Indian nationals are being brought in to complement our workforce? And Tan Si Leng said, oh, the great numbers is a result of the big, the rapid rise of the IT industry. Certain sectors like the IT industry. But how do you allow a situation to develop where if you go to Changi Business Park, 90, 95% of the workers you see there are Indian nationals. How does a government allow that situation to develop? It is beyond me. And Lee Hsien Loong can post on his Facebook and say, oh, FTAs are crucial to us. We must remain open. Yes, we, there are problems such as Singaporeans not liking too many foreigners living in close proximity or working in close proximity. But those are problems that we have to resolve. But it is unfair to castigate FTAs. I will ask Lee Hsien Loong, why did you allow a situation to develop to such an extent? If you go to Changi Business Park, 90 to 95% of the workers there are from one country. All right? And that is my other grouse about SECA. Do you know something, my fellow Singaporeans? The Indian government has always been eager to push for the freedom of labor, freedom of professionals in the treaties they signed with other countries. I suppose Singapore must have been one of the first countries to sign with them under SECA. And in there, you find this Article 9, which governs the movement of labor across the borders. Ong Yi Kang may say, Oh, Article 9 does not prevent us from exercising immigration control over Indian nationals. That may be true. But the fact of the matter is that there are so many of them in our country. So many Singaporeans have complained. You have enclaves in the East which are filled to a huge extent by people of Indian origin. How did you exercise your immigration control 
to an extent where this situation has developed. Obviously, you have not controlled it well. All right? You have not controlled it well. But you know something? I think Seika was probably a precursor of what the Indian government tried to do with other trade partners when it negotiated trade treaties with them. And for a long time, India was in negotiations with other big countries like China, like Japan and other people over what was known as the regional cooperation for economic partnership, the RCEP. This was going to be a huge trading block. All right? They negotiated for some six to seven years, I think even eight years. No success. Why? Because India wanted the freedom of movement of its people. And countries like China balked and refused because they knew the consequences of what would happen. All right? The Chinese were not that stupid. They were not going to, be, uh, they were not going to allow their labor markets to be pillaged. Yeah? And that is the other big concern. Whenever we talk about FTAs, we talk about trade treaties, they must not be a mechanism for another country to export its unemployed into our country. I mean, I checked out some figures today, my friends. If you go to a blog called Statista, S-T-A-T-I-S-T-A dot com, you will find the employment or unemployment statistics for India. And I want to give you some figures. Do you know that an Indian national who holds a Bachelor of Engineering and or a Bachelor of Technology has the best chance of employment in his country? But do you know what that rate of employment is? That rate of employment is only 47%. 46.82% to be exact. What does that mean? It means that there are about 53% of graduates holding a Bachelor of Technology degree who are unemployed. You come down to an Indian national educated in India holding a master, a master degree of computer applications do you know what is his rate of employability? It goes down to 22.42%. 22.42%. That means about 78% of graduates holding a master's of computer application in India are unemployed. All right? And in Singapore, how many thousands of Indians, of Indian nationals are employed in places like Changi Business Park? And we have been on this fintech route, on this IT route for decades now, with the government promising that we would be a high technology economy. And as many of you have queried, why has our education system not caught up? Why did we not train Singaporeans? to do these good jobs. These are the jobs of the future because we are in the knowledge era. But instead today, my friends, the unemployment rate for our youth up to the age of 29 stands at a startling 9.8%. It was over 10% last year. I believe it was 10%, 10.6% last year. Today, it stands at 9.8%. All right? And I even have the further breakdown from Zhu Hian, Leong Zhu Hian, our party's financial spokesperson. 40,700 people up to the age of 29 
are unemployed in Singapore. And these are the official statistics, yeah? The unofficial ones, I'm telling you, are higher. Of which, 12,400 of them are degree holders. 13,200 are diploma and professional qualifications holders. We have a lot of unemployed youths, unemployed youths who are well qualified. What is the government doing to train them to take up these well-paying jobs, such as in the IT industry? It does nothing. Yeah, it offers you what is known as skills future. How many people have been able to switch jobs profitably, beneficially through skills future? A couple of years ago, I found out from someone knowledgeable that the two most popular skills future courses were number one, private hire drivers, right? How to qualify to become a PHV driver. And the second was K-pop or Korean drama, something to that effect. Let's be real. If someone has to study three to four years to get a degree, to be properly qualified in order to get a job, you think that person can make the same transition by going for a $500, $1,000 skills future course? Let's get real here. Yeah. So the government spends little effort to ensure that Singaporeans are trained to the right degree for the good jobs, but at the same time, it imports. It imports foreigners such as Indian nationals to come in to do IT jobs, which are the jobs of the future. And what our, our locals reduce to? And as many of you have commented, you, look, you go to the streets of Singapore today and you look at the grab drivers you look at the delivery boys, you know, many of them are well qualified, my friends. Many of them are well qualified. And it pains me when I hear our ministers tout things like hawkerpreneurship, all right? Or we want a younger generation of cleaners. And a few years ago, the Straits Times was singing praises of being a grab driver, a PHV driver. These are honest jobs, no doubt, my friends. But for our young who are well qualified to be doing these jobs is underwhelming, to say the least. We cannot have a country at the end of the day where you tell Singaporeans Oh, we must remain open because we have no natural resources. And yet, you sacrifice the one natural resource you have and the greatest resource, your own people. You know, my friends, and I'm sure many of you who are parents will agree with my sentiments. I grew up in a very well-educated family. Both my parents were very highly educated. They were university educated. And they always told me. And I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, the Lee Kuan Yew era. And I still remember what my father used to tell me. He said, son, you know, we are not going to leave you with anything, but we will make sure that we give you the best education. Because with the best education, you can make the best life for yourself. And I am sure many Singaporeans grew up with that mantra. All right? But today, Singapore parents having spent a ton of money, many of them having to fork out for expensive overseas universities because their children are not even allowed entry into our local universities, still stand a chance 
of their children not being employable when they graduate. I don't think that is right. And I don't think any government that stands by that is doing right for its people. You know, to me, the art of government <laughs> is nothing extraordinary. All right? Don't be fooled by the PAP who will tell you that you need special talent to be in government or we need to, spare, to take in the best, pay the best. All right? Because otherwise, Singapore will fail. At the end of the day, my friends, government is really about what choices the people want to make for themselves. Every political decision is a choice. And I always liken the role of a government to that of a father. You better make sure that you take care of your own people first, because they are your own children. You don't go out and adopt a foreign child and neglect your own child. Because if you do, you are a bad father. And let me say something in conclusion about what the PAP have done to deflect criticism of SACA and not to confront the truth. All of a sudden, you know, you hear a lot of talk about racism, xenophobia, nativism, and so forth. My friends, being concerned for your countrymen, wanting them to have the best jobs, wanting Singaporeans to have priority for jobs, is not being racist. It is not being xenophobic. It is not being nativist. Nativists. I have absolutely no time for politicians who talk in that manner. Racism is not a problem in Singapore. It is absolutely not a problem. If tomorrow Singapore were to draw up a similar treaty such as SACA, we say another big country, Brazil. Let's give Brazil as an example, and thousands of Brazilians start coming in, I will still raise the same opposition. Are you then going to accuse me of being racist to the Brazilians? No, right? Because I am concerned about jobs for Singaporeans. So don't be fooled by all this talk of racism, xenophobia, nativism. This is what I call the dead cat strategy flung by those people who have no answer to the problems they themselves have created with SACA. You know what is the dead cat strategy? It is a very common political strategy when you have no answer but you want to distract the electorate, the voters, you throw what is known as a dead cat. All right? So a dead cat could be something like racism. And you hope that by throwing this dead cat on the table, people start talking about it. And isn't that what has happened in Singapore the last couple of months? Suddenly, you find this plethora of talk about racism, xenophobia, nativism. But where is the solution to this problem known as SACA? All right? Where is the problem to this? Where is the solution to this problem? which the manpower minister was not even forthcoming. He said the number of EPs from India have doubled from 13% in 2005 to 25%. No, that is not the real number. The number of EPs from India, do you know, has increased by 486 times because in 2005 the number of EP holders was 65,000. 14% of that 
14% of 65 compared with 25% of 177,000 EP holders in 2020. That is not a doubling. That is not a 100% increase. That is a 486% increase in EP holders from one country. Terry, my fellow Singaporeans, I think I have said enough at this stage. I think I have laid out very clearly what is my position, what is People's Voice position as far as SACA is concerned. I have not seen any tangible benefits that have flowed down to the Singapore people and I will continue to campaign for its outright abolition. Thank you.